John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, 13. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is the word of the Lord. Um, when Scott said, uh, this is the word of the Lord, uh, it reminded me that when we're hearing the scriptures being read, and uh, especially here in the gathered assembly, uh, that phrase is not just a throwaway phrase. That's not a, a filler phrase that transitions us from the reading of scriptures to the preaching of the sermon. That's a reminder that what we are hearing read to us this morning is what God is saying to us this morning. This is God's word. This is his, his inspired, infallible word for us to focus on this morning. So with that in mind, let's pray together and ask that God would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to receive what the Lord has said to us in his word. Father, that is our desire. We recognize that apart from you, we can do nothing. Uh, Lord Jesus, you told us to abide in you, and as we abide in you, uh, your life flowing through us will cause us to bear much fruit for the glory of God. And uh, Lord, we want that to be worked in us more fully this morning. We want that to be worked in us more fully in the week ahead. Um, and in the months and years ahead, as many as you will to give us, Lord, we want to be more greatly conformed to the image of Christ. And we want our lives to reflect your grace and your goodness, your holiness and righteousness in greater and greater degrees until that day when we finally reach the glory that you have prepared for us as your children. Father, that happens. I know that you work that in us through the ministry of your word, being applied by the Holy Spirit to each one of our hearts and in our unique situations and circumstances. Father, there's no way that I could exhaust, exhaustively apply or even seek to apply or even uh, begin to imagine how to apply the word that you've given us this morning to each and every individual circumstance represented here uh, by the people sitting before me. But in your grace and by your power, Lord, according to your wisdom and by your Holy Spirit, you are able to do exactly that. You are able to bring this word to bear upon us in the way that, in the exact way that we need to hear it. And you are able to encourage and convict and strengthen and teach and train, rebuke and reprove by your gracious and holy will. And uh, Father, we pray that you would work that among us this morning. Lord, we pray for those who are not able to be here among us, whether through illness or, um, or just through pain and body aches and uh, severe pain or, or other circumstances. God, we pray that you would minister to them, that you would let them know that they are missed in the congregation of the saints this morning, uh, but also, Lord, that you are with them where they are at this moment, and you are, you are for them in Christ. So Lord, I pray that you would use the means of grace to encourage their souls in the truth, strengthen them, and Lord, we pray by your grace you would restore them to this gathering by your will next week. Now, Father, we, we come to your word. We pray that you would apply it, that you would use it to refine us for the glory of Christ, for the sake of his name, for the testimony of your grace in this world. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, 
You guys awake this morning? Some of, some of you are awake this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Not done yet. <laughs> Not done yet. Yeah. But I'll work on it. <laughs> well, for a number of weeks, we have been looking at how God has moved to address humanity's darkness as it's presented in the opening verses of John chapter 1. We've been specifically looking at verses 6 to 13 for a number of weeks now, uh, noticing three things that God's done to overcome and conquer our darkness and to redeem sinners for the sake of his name. Uh, We saw, first of all, by sending John, who serves as the culmination of the ministry of the prophets, the entire Old Testament, finds its apex in, this, in the ministry of John, at least as far as its purpose is concerned. Its purpose is to point us to Christ, point us to the coming of the Messiah who would save us from our sin and deliver us out of our darkness and reconcile us unto God. That was what the ministry of John the Baptist was all about. It was really the summation of the entire ministry of all the prophets, beginning from uh, our fall into sin until the coming of Christ. Then secondly, God moved to address our darkness by sending the light into the world. Uh, The light has been shining upon us who are in the world since the beginning of time, but our state is now such that we can no longer discern that light that is shining upon us. The Son of God has been illuminating our minds, our consciences. He has been testifying to us through creation and through conscience about the truth of God and the glory of God that is revealed through him. But in our state of sin and darkness, we were not able to discern that. So how does God uh, move to conquer that darkness that is within us, to conquer that ignorance and that inability to comprehend the light? Well, he chooses to send forth the light into the world to shine among us from the midst of us. So no longer shining in upon us, but shining from among us and testifying to the grace of God revealed through him. And then thirdly, as we began looking at last week, God's plan to overcome our darkness and redeem sinners for his glory includes ensuring that the light of his son, though rejected by the majority of people, would yet be seen and comprehended by those whom he has chosen to save. God has ensured that his only begotten son's glory will be beheld and will be believed by those whom he has chosen to save out of this darkness. How does he do that? That's what we're looking at in verse 13. He does this by providing and accomplishing in the souls of his elect people what is called the new birth. Whereas verses 12 through 13 make clear, he ensures that certain sinners would receive Christ and would believe in his name by causing them to be born again, or born of God, out of their darkness, and set free to behold the glory of Christ. That's what John 1.13 is introducing us to. We're going to see that more fully unpacked once we get to John chapter 3. Um, but here, we're simply being introduced to this idea of being born of God. Now, as we mentioned last week, John 1.13 is not really addressing the substance of what the new birth is. Uh, that, as I just mentioned, that's going to be dealt with in John chapter 3. But the main thrust uh, for us to notice here in John 1.13 is of this verse making clear to us what the source of this new birth is. So as we are introduced to being born of God, the idea that no one is saved apart from being born of God, John wants to make it very clear from the beginning where that new birth comes from. What instigates it? What causes it to happen? What brings it about in the life of a sinner? Well, John 1.13 answers that in three different, or excuse me, four different ways. Three of them are negative. And, and, They did not come about, and it does not come about in this way, and one of them is positive. It does come about in this way. Last week, we saw two of those statements, um, two of those negative statements, the first one being that the new birth is not the result of having been born of blood. That is, no one is born into a right relationship with God because of the family 
uh, that they are born to or because of the people group into which they are born. That was really important for the Jews to understand when the Messiah came, that it was not enough for them to have been born as physical descendants of Abraham. That was not enough to ensure that they would belong to the kingdom of the Messiah. In order to belong to this spiritual kingdom of the Messiah, even the Jews had to be born again spiritually. And uh, we looked at that last week. The new birth of God does not come about simply because of who your mommy or your daddy were. It comes about because God the Father has moved in your life to bring about a new spiritual principle that makes you alive to God in Christ Jesus. Born again. The second negation that John mentions here in uh, John 1.13 is that the new birth is not produced by the will of the flesh. That is, no one has been born again and no one ever will be born again and set free in order to believe and in and receive Jesus. No one will ever be set free to believe in Christ simply because they choose to be set free to believe in Christ. As we noted last week, our darkness goes much deeper than the choices that we make, right? If our darkness was merely a matter of making bad choices, then we would be able in and of ourselves to make a good choice. We would be somewhat in this neutral stance between good and evil, and we would be able to choose in and of ourselves to do what is good, right? But what John is telling us here right from the beginning is that no human being has the ability to will him or herself free from their enslavement to sin. Romans chapter 6, we are born as slaves to sin. How are we going to be set free from that? Is it going to be by, by just gutting up enough willpower to conquer that sin that has enslaved us and then make ourselves the children of God? Is it really a matter of us choosing to let go of the sin that everything inside of us craves naturally in our fallen state? Is it merely a matter of choosing to let go of all of that and choosing to move towards Jesus Christ? Is that what constitutes salvation and being born again? Well, John 1.12 and John 1.13 gives us a resounding answer to that question. No, that is not what being born again is all about, and that is not the glory of our salvation. The glory of our salvation, if anyone is saved, is not the glory of us choosing to be saved. It's the glory of God choosing to save us. Jesus is going to make this much more clear in John chapter 6. Right? And this is the chapter where the majority of people, after they hear Jesus teaching about mankind's utter inability to come to him apart from God saving and bringing that person to Jesus first, this is the chapter where the majority of people who are following Jesus turn and walk away from him. Because they say, wow, this is a difficult teaching. Who can bear this? Jesus calling out to them and saying, it is utterly impossible for you to come to me. John 6, 44. It is utterly impossible for anyone to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now that is not only a statement of our utter inability. No one is able to come to me. But it is also a statement of everyone's utter dependence upon God to bring about a saving work in his or her life. No man can come to me unless something happens, unless this happens, unless God draws them to me. Then they will come, and I will raise him or her up on the last day. We'll unpack that more when we get there eventually. It will be a while. We see the same thing in Romans 8, verses 7 through 8. This testimony that mankind is not able in and of himself or no man or woman is able in and of himself or herself to will themselves to be saved. Why? Well, because Romans 8, 7 through 8, the mind that is set on the flesh, this, this, this state of mind into which all of us have been born, 
We have all been born as sinners. We have all been born corrupted. We are all born into this state of John 1.5, this state of darkness, this state of darkness in which we are no longer able to comprehend the light of God shining in the face of Christ. The mind that is set on the flesh, that mind is naturally hostile toward God. Now, if that's your mindset with which you were born, what does that say about your posture towards God? If you have a mindset that is enmity against God, what does that say about your actions that you're going to choose to do? They're going to be governed by this principle of being an enemy of God. What does it say about the the affections that you're going to feel? Are they going to be towards God or are they going to be towards things that God hates? Things that are belonging to the camp of God's enemy. Obviously, it's going to be the latter. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. Right? There's no, con- there's no harmony here between God's standard of righteousness and what we want to do. It does not submit itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot or are not able to please God. Now, is that not a clear statement of our utter inability to choose to do that which is good in the eyes of God? Someone might say, well, this is talking about keeping the law. This is talking about being righteous in God's sight. Obviously, no one can do that. Well, let me ask you a question. It says here, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's a pretty qual- that, that, that's a, a A qualitative statement, right? Is it pleasing to God to believe in Jesus Christ? Is it pleasing to God to turn away from your sin and follow after the Lord as your only hope of salvation? Yes, it is. That is ultimately what's pleasing to God. You go read 1 John. What is the commandment of our God? It's that we would repent of our sin and believe upon his son and then walk in his ways. Well, this verse tells us we are not in and of ourselves able to do that. We cannot please God on our own. And that's why Romans 9, 16, after quoting from verse, in verse 15, quoting from Exodus 34, where the Lord, or 33, where the Lord says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Verse 16 says, so then... It does not depend on the one who wills or on the one who runs, but who does it depend upon? It depends upon God who chooses to have mercy. That is what John 1.13 is making clear whenever it tells us that no one has been born as a child of God by the will of the flesh. No one has been able to make themselves children of God simply because they willed it. Now, in this verse, that's all summary, really, from last week and adding a little bit to it. But in this verse, John adds one more statement telling us where the new birth does not come from. Sinners who are enabled to come to Christ, who are enabled to believe in him and receive him for who he is, they're not those, they're not brought into that state because of their bloodline. they are not brought, that is not brought about by the will of their own flesh. And then thirdly, it is not the result of what John calls the will of man. So no man has been born, no woman has been born, no child has been born as a child of God by the will of man. Now all these statements are being piled one on another in order to make clear that humanity contributes absolutely nothing to the work of accomplishing salvation. Nothing comes from us in order to make us savable in the eyes of God or in order to even make us able to receive salvation. No one was ever made a child of God because of who their daddy or mama was. No one was ever made a child of God because they found enough willpower to conquer their darkness and make it happen. And here, neither has anyone ever been born as a child of God through the will of another or by the collective will of humanity. The will of man has never produced 
uh, the, never brought about the product of anyone being born of God. In other words, the new birth is not brought about by anything resulting from human endeavor. None of us can be brought out of our darkness by the will, the, the, the designs, the intentions of our own souls, nor those of anyone else's. We're not born again by the desire or the will of a mother, a father, a brother or a sister or a friend. We are not able to be brought into the new birth by a spiritual leader or the persuasive speech of a pastor or preacher or a deacon or a counselor. No one else's desires are able to save someone from eternal death and from their state of sin. Salvation is never built upon the persuasion of the wisdom of man. You see that in 1 Corinthians 2, but solely upon the power of God, working salvation into him or her. Now, obviously, that means that the world, by its collective efforts, will never be able to address man's true need of reconciling him unto God. Not by community action programs or psychiatrists or psychologists or by social liberation or social justice type categories. None of that is ever going to be enough to bring us out of our greatest problem and bring us into the only answer. We are sinners, we are trapped in darkness, and there's nothing that the collective will of humanity can do in order to deliver us out of the state that we're in or reconcile us unto the God who made us. We need new birth, and we need that new birth to come from God. But I want to mention something here, and I want to camp for this. I want to camp here for a minute. Not only does that mean that nothing in the world will ever accomplish salvation for any sinner, but it also means that even in the church of the redeemed, even among those who have been born of God, we do not have the power or the authority or the ability to cause anyone to become God's child. With all of our ingenuity, with all of our creativity, with our collective strength of will, we cannot cause anyone to be made a child of God. Now, some of you might be amening that quietly to yourselves. I can't hear you. But despite the reality that that is the case, there are so many who try to accomplish that very thing. There are all kinds of marketing strategies and business models that are being thrust upon places that are labeled by the name church. I get all, you guys know, I get all kinds of emails giving me different strategies of how to make the church more consumerable for those who are out in the world, more palatable to their tastes. All kinds of manipulative tactics and gimmicks that are based upon the psychology of men and of the world, whether it's the fog machines that we're talking about or the strobe lights or the concert music or the easy, simplified, watered-down sermons, right? You guys know the passage, you're supposed to long for the pure spiritual milk of the word. Well, you go into some places that are called churches, the only thing you're getting is skim milk. You're not getting the pure stuff. You're getting extremely watered down, just colored water is what, you, what you're getting. I, 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 I really cut out a lot from this section because I don't want to just rail against the things that are wrong in our society today. But you know how ridiculous it is that many churches actually participate in sending out surveys to their neighborhoods to find out what lost carnal people want so that they can implement that into their church services and try and draw them in. Do you know that that, that really happens? And it's actually far more common than what you would imagine. Maybe you're like, yeah, Seth, I know that happens. It's shocking to me to see how often this is propagated among churches that I thought maybe were a little more solid than that. 
You expect that from the Joel Osteen type churches, from, from you know, people who gather under Joyce Meyer or, or anyone else, um, Stephen Furtick, all these other crazy loonies. You, you, expect that, you expect that from people like that. You expect it from people who are trapped within that Southern Baptist convention type mindset of just bigger church means better church, means more faithful church. You expect that from them. You don't expect to find these kinds of things from people who are claiming to hold to the principles of Reformed theology. You don't expect to find that from people who have spent decades preaching the true gospel and then all of a sudden in the last three years they've taken this sharp left turn out in the left field. We have no idea. What are you doing out there? It's, it's tantalizing. It's attractive. It's, there's something that has shifted in the last couple years among our churches in this country where, where people are being exposed for what they really are. And one of the ways that's manifesting is, is by these ridiculous kind of tactics, tactics such as surveys trying to incorporate worldly things into the life of the church in order to be more palatable or more attractive to the world. That's not biblical Christianity, and that's never going to bring about the new birth in anyone's life. All the surveys in the world, they can come back telling us that what the world wants is no preaching. Maybe a pep talk would be fine, make me feel good about myself, but don't preach at me. It's a sad thing that there are many Christians who actually feel that way too. Give me short services. Give me entertaining music. Not so much of that puritanical, old, fuddy-duddy notion of holiness and righteousness. I don't want to hear about all that stuff. That's old stuff, man. Give me something fresh. Give me something relevant. Teach me how to balance my checkbook. That would be helpful. Amen. It doesn't doesn't work like that. Yeah, That's right. That's right, Eger. You preach it, brother. Well, what else? Oh, you, we find from these surveys, you don't want to hear about gospel repentance and what it means to have genuine faith because that maybe makes you feel a little unsettled. Churches today are, are not, without batting an eye, are saying, oh, no worries, don't worry about that. We'll tickle your ears. You just tell us where they itch. You don't want so much teaching, so much theology? No problem, it's gone. We're only losing our own souls and the souls of our hearers, but who cares about that, man? We're here in the, in the here and now. We've got the building program. We've got the budget to set. We've got programs to run. We've got a reputation to maintain in the world. Besides that, we're the ones with all the people in our congregations. Now, all the collective gimmicks and psychology and strategizing in the world might draw a crowd, but they will never be powerful enough and they will never be effective in the hands of God to cause a single sinner to become his child. If anyone is saved in those environments, it's in spite of those environments, not because of them. I was saved by God's grace in in an environment that was like that. Now, I think that for the most part in this room, we would all agree, we would all be in agreement with what I just said. We would all think that what I've just described is ridiculous, right? We see through that stuff. But beloved, we also need to come to grips with the fact that even we as the church of God who are striving to faithfully do his will, even we do not have the ability to make one single sinner a child of God. We cannot overcome the darkness that has entrapped anyone else. We're utterly helpless to do that. So the question then is, what then do we do? If the new birth is never accomplished according to the will of man or by the will of man, if nothing that we do is ever going to bring anyone into saving faith in Jesus Christ in and of itself, if we don't have the power to do that, then what are we to do? Do we just sit around passively saying, well, God is sovereign. He's going to do what he wants to do. And I suppose if he's that sovereign that he, people can only be saved by his sovereign working, then I guess he's going to have to do it. I won't worry about it. I'm not going to worry about evangelizing. I'm not going to worry about praying for the lost. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, isn't it all dependent upon God's will as to whether or not someone's going to be saved? Yes, it is. But that's the wrong attitude to have, and that's definitely the wrong result. 
If you come away thinking that after studying the doctrine of God's sovereignty, you've missed it. And you need to go back and study it again. What do we do? What do we do if there's nothing in and of itself that we can do that will cause anyone to be saved? What then are we expected to do? Well, I think God's sovereignty, far from being a reason or an excuse for us to fall into passivity and inaction, reality is just the opposite. It's the sovereignty of God that is actually functioning as the reason that we must diligently use the means God has appointed to save sinners. Philippians chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, it tells us that we can use the means of being diligent to order our own steps by the gospel so that we shine in the midst of the world as bright as lights as we possibly can. We stand here as witnesses to the world and we are designed by God. We are created, recreated in Christ so that we would shine in the midst of the world. It says in verse 16, by holding fast to the word of truth. So what can we do? Well, we can order our own steps to make sure that we are walking as faithfully and as diligently according to the will of God revealed in the gospel as is possible. So that our testimony before men is untainted. 1 Peter 3.15, what can we do? We can work hard at sanctifying Christ as Lord in our own hearts. Having our own hearts filled with the sense of Christ's glory and cultivating a deeper heartfelt allegiance to him as Lord. So that at any moment when we are asked, we're prepared and we're ready to give a defense for the hope that is in us. This is an expectation, this responsibility the Lord places on us as believers. Now, just as a side note here, if we can all be honest with ourselves, or maybe if I can be honest with you, most of the time when I have an opportunity to share about the hope that is in me because of Christ, most of the time when I don't feel prepared and ready to share in that moment, it's because I have not been diligent in sanctifying Christ as Lord in my heart. I haven't been laboring to practice the presence of God, if you will. I haven't been keeping my mind fixed upon His truth. I have not been devoting myself to prayer constantly the way the Lord calls me to. I have not been practicing the means of faith and walking in faith every step of my day. When I have not been doing those kinds of things, even when the opportunity presents itself to me to share about Christ, I feel unprepared. So what can we be doing to make sure that we're ready and we're able and we're prepared to share the hope of glory that we have in Christ when the opportunity comes? Well, we can start by sanctifying Christ as Lord in our hearts. And then, in doing that, we can devote ourselves to continuing to preach the only message that will save any sinner. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. How is anyone going to be brought to saving faith in the Lord? It's going to be through the message of salvation in Jesus Christ being proclaimed to them. You've heard that saying that says, uh, um, preach the gospel, use words when necessary. That's, that's, a, that's a load of malarkey. Right? That, that, that's a, a hill of beans that is, that is unsubstantial. You cannot preach the gospel without using words. And if you don't use words in speaking to other people about what Jesus Christ has come to save, has done to save sinners from their sin, then that sinner will never be saved. It is through the message, it is through the proclamation of salvation in Jesus Christ that God in his sovereign goodness chooses to move upon a sinner and bring them out of darkness and into his light. Therefore, we must continue to devote ourselves to speaking the word of Christ. Now, that is going to mean that we're going to be preaching a message that is indeed a stumbling block to the world. 
We're going to be preaching a message that is foolishness to the vast majority of people in this world, but we need to remember the promise of 1 Corinthians 1, that even though the gospel is foolishness and a stumbling block to some, to those who are the called, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God and is the wisdom of God. If we go out preaching the gospel and people don't listen and they think we're foolish and they mock and they scoff at us, what's that to us? That's not our calling. That's not our responsibility. We are called to continue preaching that gospel faithfully. And those whom God calls through that gospel will see in the gospel the power of God. They will see in the gospel the wisdom of God. Those are the ones that we're seeking when we go out to share the message of Christ. So what can we do? We can be diligent to order our steps according to God's ways so that our testimony before the world continues to magnify the character and nature of God. We can devote ourselves to sanctifying Christ as Lord in our hearts so that we're ready to share Christ when the opportunity comes. We can continue preparing ourselves and actually practicing the work of speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ into the world. And then one more thing. Adding to all of this, We can devote ourselves to fervently and desperately praying to the God who alone has the power to save the lost. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read that. Just follow with me. Paul says, First of all, then, I exhort that petitions and prayers, requests and thanksgivings be made for all men for kings and for those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. Two things, briefly. Here, clearly, we see that God has a desire that all men would come to salvation. All kinds of men. All kinds of women. What does he want us to do in our efforts to see all kinds of men and women saved? He calls us to pray. Pray for them that the Lord would save them. Whether we're praying for them specifically by name that God would save them or as Colossians 4.3 tells us, whether we're praying to, for God to give us an opportunity to speak the gospel message to them. That should be another part of our prayers on behalf of the lost. Lord God, give me the opportunity that I need in order to speak the message of the gospel to this person. How many times are we pleading before the Lord for the lost in our own families and in our neighborhoods and our workplaces? How often are we actually specifically bringing anyone up before the Lord by name and saying, Lord, I am asking that you give me an opportunity to speak the truth of the gospel to this person. Open the door, Lord. Let me walk through it. I think that's what the Lord wants from us. Or Ephesians 6, 19 praying that the Lord would give us boldness, the boldness that we need to speak that word faithfully when the opportunity comes. In all of these different ways, we're called to pray and use the means of prayer for the salvation of the lost. So what can we do? Well, in all our labors, we can remember that God is the only one who can cause spiritual growth and that he uses means such as our faithful and diligent labors He uses means to bring about spiritual life in the lives of sinners. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. What can we do? If God is this sovereign and salvation is entirely dependent on him and is not affected by us, what can we do? Well, we can continue to be confident in the sovereignty of God and we can rest in it and continue laboring in faith. Now, I can already, the time has slipped by me and I was not wanting it to go this fast. But let me say this before I move to the last point and close out verse 13. This should be the greatest encouragement for us 
as we seek to reach out to our lost neighbors and our loved ones with the gospel. The fact that we can do nothing to save them and it's all dependent upon God, that should be the greatest encouragement for us to keep reaching out to them. So often we're paralyzed by fear, right? Fear that we're going to say something wrong. Fear that we're not going to do something right. Fear that we're going to mess it up. Guys, you got to get your mind out of yourself in this endeavor and you have to set your mind upon the God of glory. You've got to have this right view of God shaped in your mind and in your heart if you are going to be faithful in witnessing for his sake to the lost. Because then you have the confidence to know that even if I mess something up, God is greater than my mistakes and he can overcome it. Even if it's, if it's a full exposition of Isaiah 53 and I'm explaining everything that Jesus did in his atoning work and in his substitutionary sacrifice for sinners, even then God is able to use that to save sinners. Think of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. But at the same time, in the power and the sovereignty of God, he is also able to use the mere mention of the name Jesus to bring someone to salvation. We got to get our limited view of God's power and glory out of our minds and be reshaped by the scriptures. The sovereignty of God should never be used for us as a means to become passive or to become paralyzed with fear or indifference. The sovereignty of God is revealed to us to give us encouragement, to give us strength, to give us confidence and boldness that we need to move forward in doing God's will in the midst of a hostile world. Paul could say in Colossians 1.28, I admonish every man. I seek to teach every man with wisdom so that to this end that I might be able to present every single person mature or complete in Christ. Paul knew more about God, the doctrine of God's sovereignty and God's election than I think anyone, any other writer in Scripture. He understood these things. And yet here we find him saying in Colossians 1, 9, 29, For this I also labor. I labor so that I would be able to present everyone that I'm interacting with to the Lord in perfect, in perfect maturity. That's the attitude of someone who truly understands the biblical doctrine of God's sovereignty. It doesn't lead to lethargy or indifference or passivity. It leads to action and it leads to encouragement and it leads to confidence to do God's will. When I wrote that, I was reminded of what Spurgeon said, another solidly reformed brother. Spurgeon said, if sinners are to be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. I don't, I, it's, it's very rare that I ever meet someone who believes in the sovereignty of God and salvation that manifests that in their lives. He went on to say, if hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. Spurgeon believed in the absolute sovereignty of God and in, in his utter inability to convert a single soul by his own efforts. But that knowledge did not paralyze him into inaction. That knowledge served to drive him to strive all the more, being confident in God's ability to save. So let that be us. Let that be us. Now, I need to move on. There is one more quote here from Spurgeon. Just go ahead and move on to that one, Hans. I'll throw this at you. I think this quote right here contains the greatest principle for understanding how to walk that delicate line between God's sovereignty and our responsibility. We cannot regard God's absolutely sovereign acts as a rule for our actions. He may in his own absoluteness do what pleases him best, but we must act as his plainer dispensations instruct us. What are those plainer dispensations? What he's revealed is pleasing to him in his word. So, throw that at you. All right, so according to John 1.13, no sinner has been brought out of darkness and into God's marvelous light in Christ because of the family to which they were born or because of their own will or strength of willpower. 
nor because of the will of other people. How then are sinners delivered out of darkness and enabled to receive the light of God shining in Christ? John 1.13 says, only by being born of God. Only by experiencing the spiritual birth that comes from God. Our ability to come to Christ is given to us when we receive the new birth from God. When we are made partakers of that new birth. Now, I don't want to deceive anyone. There are many people who disagree with what I just said. Maybe representative of the last century would be the position or the statement of Billy Graham. And I don't want to take this as an opportunity to air dirty laundry or anything like that. Uh, I think much of what happened through Billy Graham was a great blessing. Um, however, as he wrote in his book, How to Be Born Again, he says, any person who is willing to trust in Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord can receive the new birth now. Now, just let me ask, for Billy Graham, which one comes first? The new birth from God or a willingness to receive it? According to this statement, it's a willingness to receive it. Now, that perspective has been the dominant perspective in this country for almost a century and a half. But what you need to understand is that if you move back further than 120, 130, 140 years, this would, the sovereignty of God would be what you would be heard proclaim, what you would be hearing proclaimed from the pulpits. This position, it's not unknown to the history of the church, but in Protestant churches, it is new for it to have the kind of sway that it has in our day. Billy Graham says, it's if you're willing to trust in Jesus Christ that you can receive the new birth. The scriptures say just the opposite. The scriptures say that salvation is not ultimately in the hands of the sinner. It's not ultimately up to the, the sinner's willingness to receive it. It is ultimately in the hands of God. And can we be real about something? I don't want my salvation resting in anything other than God's sovereign hands. If my salvation was dependent upon my willingness to receive it or my willingness to keep it, I'm up a creek without a paddle. I am helpless. I am utterly defenseless against myself in that scenario. If God is telling me, son, you need to get up and you need to run in the ways of the gospel, just do it. Just get the willpower and do it. Stand up. Get on your feet. Leave your sin. Let go of those affections and those evil desires. Move towards me according to my will revealed to you in, your wor in my word. You know what I want. Now just get up and do it. If it were up to me to do that, I would be lost. And I would bust the gates of hell wide open. You know, my faithfulness, maybe you can identify with this, but as I've walked, even with the Lord, uh, almost 18 years, I have recognized that my faithfulness is exactly what Hosea 6.4 describes was the faithfulness of Ephraim. The Lord says, your faithfulness is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. How many of you know that to be true of yourself? Man, I've got these faithful desires, I've got these endeavors, I've got these resolutions that I'm going to commit myself unto the Lord. I'm not going to miss a day of Bible reading. I'm going to make sure I'm on my knees praying. I'm going to walk by faith. I'm going to witness to everyone I possibly can. You renew this commitment unto the Lord, and then you go out that same day, maybe an hour later, and it's all completely washed away by your unfaithfulness. That's me. I don't want my salvation resting upon my will. I don't want my salvation resting upon anyone else's will other than God's will. 1 Peter 1.3 tells us, thankfully, we don't have to rest on anyone else's will in order to enjoy the salvation of God. Because it's by God's great mercy that he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. 
James chapter 1, verse 17 through 18, when James is trying to encourage the saints of the, the, um, uh, the faithfulness of God in giving this good gift of salvation to them, that they don't have to question whether he's going to be vacillating, whether he's going to be yes towards them one day and then no towards them the next day. James says in 1.17, no, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And you need to know this, beloved. It was of his own will. It was in the exercise of his own will that he brought you forth through the word of truth. Now, that's simply saying what Philippians 1.6 says, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ's revelation. So who brought about this new birth? Who brings about the result of the new birth in our lives? Well, it's the one God, the one true and living God in the exercise of his will who brings us to salvation. Now, just briefly... I know that this doctrine really rattles a lot of people. This has led to many being asked to leave churches. It's led to many pastors being fired from churches. And I myself have been called many times a cult leader and asked to leave churches because I believe simply in what John 1.13 is saying. that our salvation is entirely dependent upon God and our ability to come to Christ is fully reliant upon whether God is willing to make us able to come to Christ. I know that this rattles a lot of people, but I want to end today looking at how Jesus spoke about this matter and how he has told us we should respond to it. If you would, in your Bibles, open up to Matthew 11. Verses 25 through 28. And we're going to end on this. uh, I promise. Minus one brief statement for next week. Matthew 11, 25 through 28. Here we find Jesus addressing the very issue of God's sovereignty in the salvation of sinners. In the context, he's talking about Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin, who despite all the miracles that they had seen Jesus do, they still did not believe in him. Verse 25, what does Jesus do in response to that? It says, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Now, you got to notice this. When Jesus is talking about sinners who are rejecting him and who are not believing in him, what is Jesus' gut reaction? He doesn't throw a pity party. He doesn't sit down and try to rethink his strategy. He praises his Father for having hidden the truth from these sinners. Do you see that connection there? He is praising his father because it was the father's will to reveal these things to babes and to hide them from the wise. Verse 26, why does he do this? Jesus says, yes, father, for this is what was pleasing in your sight. Why did he do this? Why did Jesus, uh, why did, why did the father hide who Jesus was from these sinners and not let them see who he is and believe in him? Because this is what was well-pleasing in his sight. This is what he wanted to do. Verse 27, Jesus makes clear statements about God the Father and God the Son's absolute sovereignty over the salvation of sinners. He says, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and whom the Son wills to reveal him. So whose will is ultimately in control when it comes to a sinner being awakened to the reality of God? It's Jesus' will. Jesus is the one who's in control here. Now, all of that is basically what we've been saying so far. How does Jesus want us to respond to that reality, though? 
That's where verse 28 is so important. After Jesus has praised the absolute sovereignty of God over sinners, after he has praised God for hiding the the truth about Jesus from those who counted themselves to be wise, Jesus looks at them and says, what are we supposed to do with this? Jesus says, come to me. I am the one who has absolute sovereign control over whether or not you can understand and know God savingly. Therefore, you must come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How does Jesus want us to respond to this this doctrine of God's absolute sovereignty over our salvation? He wants us to respond to that by coming to him. With this statement, Jesus rebukes the tendency of our sinful hearts to misuse and apply the doctrine of God's sovereignty. According to our Lord, this is not a cause for despair, which so often is the case among people who hear of God's sovereignty for the first time. They're thrust into despair. Jesus doesn't present this to us as a reason for anyone to be indifferent or to give in to passivity. Christ's sovereignty over our salvation for Jesus ought to be the very impetus that causes us to be driven to him that encourages us to run him down and chase him down until we receive this blessing from his hand. I think that's really important to keep in mind as we are going to uncover, or as we move forward in the Gospel of John, looking more at the sovereignty of God and the salvation of sinners. We need to always keep in mind how God expects us to respond to the revelation of that truth. He expects us to respond to that by recognizing our utter dependence upon him and running to him in light of it. That's what the sovereignty of God is meant to accomplish in us. It's meant to shock us into a true awareness of how desperately helpless we truly are and into an awareness that God is our only answer. That's what it's designed to do. So no one has become a child of God through faith in Christ by being born of blood or because of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but only and solely because of the sovereign, free, gracious will of Almighty God. Now in closing here, if you are a normal person, this whole topic of God's sovereignty and salvation will bring up an unnerving question. If salvation only comes to those who have been born of God, How then do I know if I am among them? How can I know whether I've been born of God? We're going to return to look at this in greater depth next week. But simply put, in the context of John 1.13, it comes down to two things. How can I know if I am born of God? One, do I believe in Jesus Christ as the light of God? Two, do I receive him as my light? Do I believe that Jesus is the true light of God? And do I receive him as that true light for me? According to John 1, 12 to 13, those two things reveal whether or not someone has been born of God. It's how you respond to the truth of Jesus. We'll come back next week to look at that together.